and we're live. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Kate. Jeremy. Good morning. Alan. Hello, Alan. Jeremy. Christine. Thank you all for being here. Just seeing everyone into the room here. We'll give everyone a few minutes to get settled. And I will get some slides up on the screen very shortly. It's a nice sunny day here in Vancouver. How about where, where you all are? Yeah, Ottawa is uh, beautiful, sunny, and warm. Oh, wonderful. How warm mm -hmm. is warm? I think it's uh, up to 20 degrees already, right. maybe more. Okay. We'll aim for that today out here too. I think we're 15 or so already. and It's still nice and early here, so I've got my appropriate um, Copa mug for this. Oh, look this at morning. you. Okay, well, we will get things started here. I'm just going to launch this presentation. And good morning to those in the chat too. Appreciate those messages. Thank you for getting that started. Well, welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be here this morning, uh, literally as well as kind of <laughs> um, figuratively because it's quite nice to be able to connect with everyone from across the country while just staying home, being in our own in our own living rooms and that sort of thing. So thank you all for making the time and uh, spending your, it seems like sunny mornings across the country with us today. Um, so my name is Kate Klassen. We'll get into introductions a bit more a little later on. Um, but today we're talking about our pass and GA, two separate worlds that are connected by one sky. So welcome, oops, just gonna flip over to where I can advance the slides. Welcome and bienvenue. Um, we've got a really exciting set of presentations today. I'm really excited for what's coming. Um, to give you a bit of a, a heads up on what that's going to be, before we get too far into things, we're going to cover what are drones, what are our paths, is it exactly that we're talking about this morning, um, and then we'll have a presentation from Christine Gervais talking about COPA and drones, and then we'll get into some further presentations on the drone rules and then the um, NAV drone app as well. Uh, so let's click over to get some introductions um, started so that you can meet our speakers. As I mentioned, my name is Kate Klassen. I'm a director with COPA representing um, the BC province and the Yukon Territory. And um, I'm also my day job, the co-founder of VP Operations at Coastal Drone, a company that functions primarily on the education side, education and training side of the, uh, of the aviation world um, on the RPAS. For our past initiatives. And as well, we have Christine Gervais, the president and CEO of COPA. Good morning, Christine. Good morning. How are you doing today? Very good. Nice and warm. Excellent. And uh, it's beautiful Excellent. and sunny over here in Ottawa. And not at all nervous about the number of attendees that we have today. This is all feeling very relaxed. <laughs> it's just the four of us, so this is That's great. Right. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear in your own words how you came to be about in the role that you are holding now at COPA. Um, well, so I, I've been uh, the president and CEO now for um, almost 10 months, and um, I, I come from a background of aviation. I started over 25 years ago, um, went to, on an intro flight just for, the, just for the fun of it, and I was hooked. And uh, I didn't know that I wanted to do it for a living. So for the first little while, I was just earning my private pilot's license, just flying for fun, and then decided that, indeed, this is what I wanted to do with my life. So I did uh, have a career in uh, commercial aviation. And then after 10 years, uh, I moved over to air traffic control. So um, I was an air traffic controller at uh, NAV Canada in Ottawa for um, about a decade. And then I switched over to management. And uh, for me, it was just a um, organic transition in, into this role and, and being able to go back to, you know, what originally got me into this uh, community. Uh, which is, you know, small airplanes and, and just flying for the fun of it and, and just having that passion every single day. And that's pretty much how, how I ended up uh, in the role. And I think for uh, the, you know, uh, in introducing the RPAS world into a COPA, personally, I find that it's a wonderful addition to, to the world of aviation. Uh, it's innovative, the possibilities are endless. And I think it, it's just a, a, a wonderful uh, a way for, for, for um, 
aviation enthusiasts who can't necessarily, uh, you know, go inside an aircraft and fly have the opportunity to experience flight and to understand what that world is. So, um, so yeah, I, I welcome the new program at COPA. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, I'm really excited to to hearing more about that in your presentation because uh, I'm sure lots of the other attendees are as well. Um, there's a lot a lot of really exciting things that are coming from that, so I'm looking forward to it. But before we get there, I want to chat to the the other two on the call here. So Jeremy, good morning. How are you? Doing very well, Kate. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so this is Jeremy Fountain. He is the team lead of the RPAS Task Force on the operational regulatory and development and implementation side of the house. Um, Jeremy, what got you interested into RPAS? And can you tell us a little bit about your, your background there? Yeah, sure. I would love to. Um, so uh, my first introduction um, in our past was actually in the military. So I've got uh, 21 years in the RCAF, uh, quite a few operational deployments. Um, and, uh, and frankly, that was my access and my um, uh, the ability to be supported by drones in those types of fields. So it was very specific. Um, and it went dormant on the RPAS side until probably my son got interested. And I had to catch up and learn from him. and figure out how, do we, how he does it. And quite frankly, he still flies uh, better than I do. Um, but and a bit more about my background, um, and then I'll come back to my, my TC uh, experience and why I got interested in our past in that way. So yeah, 21 years in the military, a tactical helicopter pilot. Um, I grew up here. I'm in Petawawa now, uh, speaking there, working for TC in this capacity in a virtual forum. Um, yeah, quite a few operational deployments, sort of Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Africa, certainly, um, and uh, and finished up my career in the military here in Petawawa again as the commanding officer at the Griffin Squadron, and then joined Transport Canada last uh, last fall. So uh, newer to Transport Canada in the RPAS world, but actually a, quite a natural tran uh, um, transition, I think, because this is we were all be, always been looking, especially on the military side, at the newer parts of innovation. And this was always there. And I remember it quite frankly, as we we're looking at acquiring another, um, uh, I'll say crude vehicle for, for um, surveillance. And, and somebody outside said, why would you be doing that? Why are you putting a person in this aircraft that needs to fly a longer duration and watch things? That just does not make sense to me. And I said, well, that's government procurement for you because <laughs> it takes so long. So that's um, that jump was actually quite natural. Very excited about it. Um, so good friends had already moved into the RPAS world and got me involved. Um, and so I get to go to the regulatory world at Transport Canada, um, leverage things like my general aviation experience, member of COPA since 2009, proudly, um, aircraft owner for uh, the next uh, seven <laughs> years now, and happily flying my family around the uh, country when we can and when things open up again, looking forward to that. But uh, it's been a natural progression. And then I got my advanced, my basic and advanced pilot certificate uh, in the fall and found that, you know what, it's, uh, it's another aircraft. It is part of the same sky. So uh, especially for pilots, this is a pretty easy transition. Um, thank you, Kate. Yeah, it's funny how, you know, you have all, you've like extensive background in aviation, you've got all this experience and your son is, like just the natural at it because it's like video game controllers, right? They've got the dexterity and it's just, yeah, I get flown in circles because I have an older brother who never let me touch the video game remote. So I, uh, <laughs> I didn't get that growing up. Yeah. Um, and last but certainly not least, <laughs> we want to say good morning to Alan Chapman. Um, he's joining us from uh, NAV Canada. There he's the director of the RPAS traffic management. Um, and I'm sure, Alan, when you were growing up, you weren't like, you know what I want to be when I grow up <laughs> is this our past traffic management director. So I'd love to hear about um, what you were doing before then that led you into that role that probably wasn't around uh, when you got started. Yeah, that's great. great. Thanks, Kate. No, absolutely. And my uh, my background is pretty diverse, I think, to the other speakers and um, you know, really privileged to be on the panel with such experience in the, in this space. Uh, my background um, is largely uh, digitization of other industries. So um, I worked for IBM for 20, for close to 20 years and other software companies. Um, I've done a couple of other projects for Nav Canada. And then when Nav Canada moved into, uh, you know, really looking back at this space, I'll talk a little bit about the strategy that we put together later, but 
when we started looking at that, Navcander asked me to come in, help uh, both select some software uh, and also look at the strategy. And I, I fell in love with the area. I, um, you know, I really did. It's, it's a fascinating area. I think Christine spoke to this a little bit at the start. There's so much innovation, so much potential um, from this. And to do that safely and to pull that together and to integrate, uh, you know, this, this, this is a kind of a culmination of many of the things I've worked with in my career. So incredibly excited to be, uh, to be part of the team that's helping pull this together. Excellent. Yeah, it's a very exciting space, and I'm sure they appreciate your, your background in that as well. Fantastic. Um, so we're going to get back into those slides. I wonder if I do that. And before we actually, before we do that, I do want to get to know the audience here because we've had a chance to introduce ourselves. Um, the way that the chat window is working, you can send us messages in there. We're going to be um, monitoring that for uh, questions that we can pull out and post to you um, following your presentations. And um, but before we get into just so that you know how the chat works, but I do want to run the poll. Let me get this launched um, so that we can learn a little bit more about about our audience. So we're curious, what licenses and certifications do you hold? Um, are you traditional aviation only? Do you only have a drone certification or are you on both sides of things? You have both certifications and we'll leave that up for a little bit. Want to get to a feel for who we're talking to, showing 50-50, oh, flipping back and forth. This is great. Thank you all for entering that in. And as that's happening, I want to, um, before we get too far into it, make sure that we're on the same page with what we're talking about when we're talking about drones. Because I uh, find when it's a, a new topic of conversation, there's typically uh, two kind of opposing camps that people typically go to. Um, they're thinking either military drones or they're thinking the off the shelf flying real estate photography over my house type of applications. So those are definitely valid applications, but I want to kind of broaden the scope, take a look at some other things that uh, um, that are out there, um, because this I find is one of the more um, like intriguing things when your mind starts going and the technology keeps advancing, you start to think about these other applications, like some life saving applications. So in the top right, this drone was using an infrared camera for a search and rescue mission. And um, this is from the actual mission itself. So um, in Canada right now, um, Kassara and other groups, um, search and rescue groups are using, uh, using drones with infrared and um, just regular visual cameras to assist with their searches. Um, you can see how it's picking out that person in the field or the forest. I'm not sure what, what landscape it is. Um, and another application that's kind of in development is um, think about like ambulance drones. So this one is flying a defibrillator. You could also think about flying in an EpiPen or some asthma medication. Um, it could be like a first first responder before the first responders get there. Um, so interesting applications there. And then we have um, some ways that drones are changing supply chains. So we have, you know, I'm sure you're, uh, you're all familiar with Amazon Prime uh, air delivery. Um, Amazon's looking into this as well as a bunch of other companies, kind of that last leg, that last mile delivery. Um, and also just regular agricultural changes that we're seeing um, using drones to spray um, some really targeted pesticides so that you're able to use less inputs. It saves money. It's better for the environment, better for the, the rest of the crop. Um, it's really interesting changes that are happening there and it could be pesticide it could also just be spraying water um, there's lots of interesting applications along the agricultural um, side of things too and then for building um, building buildings and maintaining buildings the one you're seeing in the top right actually ties rebar together and um, so working as like an additional con construction worker on site um, alleviating, alleviating some of that um, monotonous effort and then the caged drone that you're seeing, it's kind of hard to tell, but there's a drone inside of that structure with the light and a camera, and it's able to fly into really confined spaces and bounce off of walls and not cause any damage, but inspect some areas that would be either too expensive or too challenging to put a person in on a regular basis or too dangerous to put a person in on a regular basis. Um, so some really kind of interesting applications. And then there's kind of the fun ones too, 
So using drones um, with really impressive cameras on board, I'll show you a couple videos of this, um, this type of thing afterwards. So they've got high quality cameras on these really tiny drones. We'll take a look at a video after I show you the next one too. And you may have seen uh, light displays at various events, the uh, opening ceremonies, um, Intel's using these um, drones kind of as reusable fireworks. So I'm gonna stop these slides, flip over to the videos so that we can all be impressed. So the, the first one that I showed you with the camera on top of that little drone, let's get things going. Um, this is just a clip from a video that was circulating. I will warn you that it is, there's quite a bit going on. Um, Nice, dude. Is that a audio mute for me. Um, hopefully it doesn't make anyone too motion sick, but it gives you that first person view, that FPV um, that you might have heard where someone's flying with the goggles on um, so that they're able to move in and out of really tight confined spaces and get some shots that you never would have been able to, to achieve before. Um, this one took, I think it was t 10 to 12, um, 10 to 12 attempts to, before they were able to get it nice and smooth. Um, and then here's an example of the, uh, um, the light show or a light show that can be done with these drones. So more uh, environmentally friendly than fireworks, uh, reusable, and they can do some pretty incredible maneuvering with these drones that are able to tell um, using computer programming where each other are in space. So there's no pilot kind of individually piloting each one. They're all knowing where they are and, and coordinating their flight around that. And you can still get some fireworks out of it too, which is nice. So we'll stop that video. And, uh, and then with that, I, I, I hope that I made the case for why, why we don't need to be, um, um, afraid of drones and the technology, kind of open your eyes to um, some of the different applications that are out there and how as we get the information and the technology growing around drones out to more people, um, how those applications are gonna be continuing to change. So Christine, I'll invite you to get your slides ready to go. Um, I think I've made my case that, dro that drones are cool and relevant, but I'll let you, um, talk more about COPA's interest in including drones within the membership program and what that's gonna look like. Um, so everybody can see my first slide. Okay, merci beaucoup, Kate. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, so basically what I'll just be doing is introducing our new uh, RPAS uh, program uh, that we introduced and announced yesterday uh, live on, uh, on our social media and um, I'll start a little bit about talking about COPA and then uh, and then I'll go into um, talking about uh, what the program is all about. Um, je vais commencer par parler un peu du programme uh, SATP uh, à la COPA que nous avons introduit hier et ensuite uh, je vais parler uh, un peu de, de, de la COPA pour ceux qui sont probablement pas familiers avec notre association et, um, et j'espère que uh, je, vais, je vais faire la présentation principalement en anglais uh, mais les, les diapos sont disponibles en français um, après uh, le, le séminaire donc si vous voulez uh, lire les diapos en français ils seront disponibles pour les membres uh, francophones uh, du séminaire. So, um, I'll uh, just go to the next one. So, a little bit about COPA. For those of you who might not be familiar with our association, we are Canada's largest aviation association, and uh, we all also happen to be the, the world's second largest aviation association. Uh, we have a network of uh, over 15,000 members, um, from individuals to families to corporate members. And uh, we focus on advocacy, uh, we focus on pilot training, uh, keeping uh, flying affordable, um, and, and, you know, and, and all of that together is, is helping protect every pilot's freedom to, to fly. Donc, euh, la COPA est la plus grande association euh, d'aviation au Canada. Et en passant, nous sommes la deuxième plus grande association d'aviation au monde. On a un réseau de plus de 15 000 membres. Et euh, on se concentre vraiment sur la défense euh, des intérêts de nos membres, de la formation des pilotes, euh, du maintien de l'aviation euh, à un prix abordable. Donc, tout ça euh, englobe euh, la protection de notre liberté de voler euh, au, au Canada. 
So COPA's mission is really to advance, uh, to promote and to preserve uh, our Canadian freedom to fly. And we, we really try to do that through, um, you know, inclusivity, um, embracing innovation and always maintaining the highest standard of safety and, and promoting that highest level of, of aviation safety. We are and want to continue to be the recognized voice of general aviation in the country. And we will advocate now for both piloted and remotely piloted aircraft operators. So the program vision is, um, you know, our pass um, across the industry has seen uh, exponential growth. And uh, as Kate had alluded to, uh, really, the possibilities are, are quite endless when it comes to our pass operations. Um, when, when I talked earlier in, in a previous um, seminar, I talked about um, the fact that I was a survey pilot many moons ago, it feels like a whole other life ago, you know, flying in, in areas that were quite dangerous, quite frankly, you know, uh, 15,000 feet above uh, the tops of the Andes Mountains um, with no place to, to land in case of emergency disease. Um, those things can easily be done uh, safely now uh, through um, uh, with our, our pass operation. So that's just one example. Um, so the goals of the program is actually going to be uh, charting a new future for general aviation and we'll be uh, creating spaces for transformative uh, aviation technology. Um, we want to guide the safe integration of our past um, operations with GA operations in Canadian skies. And, and, and in order to do that, we need to influence uh, equitably our past regulations. And um, again, in order to, to, to to do that, we have to safely manage the RPAS operations. And we're going to be doing that through our COPA safety programs by offering um, different uh, safety seminars, which I'll talk to uh, in a little bit. And we want to increase, mo more importantly, the operational awareness of both piloted and remotely piloted aircraft. So a lot of you have asked me, uh, why, why are we doing this now? Um, so in 2017, uh, we conducted a survey. And uh, from that survey, we developed our five-year strategic plan at uh, COPA. Part of that five-year plan was actually to introduce uh, our pass into the COPA membership. And at the same time, you know, this year is, is a great year to be doing this because the our past world, especially with the past year that we've had and, and a lot of a, a lot of traditional aviation being grounded, um, the our past world has been growing at an incredibly rapid rate, uh, not just in sales, but registration of our past of all sizes. And, you know, as Kate alluded to earlier, the, the, the benefits of our pass are, are, are definite uh, for military use, for media and film, for shipping to remote areas. Uh, I talked about surveying, uh, even aerial photography. And um, there are requirements for regulations for safe integration, and we definitely want to be part of that. And we also want to be the association that provides the education for both piloted and remotely piloted aircraft operations. So a bit of the program overview, um, you will um, have representation on our board of directors with a, a RPAS committee. Um, we, will, we do have, starting yesterday, an RPAS insurance program for both personal, uh, recreational, and commercial operations. Um, COPA member discounts for basic and advanced certification courses. The membership rate is the same as the regular membership. We have representation on Transport Canada's newly formed Canadian Drone Advisory Committee, which is known as CanadaC. We had our first meeting actually uh, this past week. We have representation on Transport Canada and NAV Canada's our past working groups and task forces. We will continue our advocacy efforts for both manned and unmanned operations, keeping in line with COPA's mission. And you'll have access to all of our member benefits. A little bit on the insurance program. It's uh, done through Magnus and Cover Drone. So it'll be uh, offering members exclusive insurance for both recreational and commercial RPAS pilots. And the insurance program, which is available nationwide, so from coast to coast to coast, uh, will include physical damage coverage, public and pro product liability, and uh, as well as professional and privacy breach liability coverage for uh, commercial drone operations. 
And uh, don't worry about writing the uh, the, the link down. Uh, you'll be able to have access to her slides and you'll be able to refer to it. But uh, you can always just go to our website uh, and type in uh, COPA drone insurance and uh, you'll easily uh, find the page there. And so this is just a quick overview of the difference between the recreational and the uh, commercial coverage by cover drone. All right, and uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the special RPAS member discounts. Um, so uh, through MIR Aviation, you'll be able to get heavily discounted training on advanced certification and training material. And Coastal Drones is actually offering COPA members free basic training, which uh, I am almost complete. So hopefully in a, couple, in, in a month, uh, I will be a, a newly certified um, basic uh, RPAS pilot and also uh, very discounted training packages and training material as well. So thank you to uh, those two uh, organizations for being part of our program. Um, so membership rates and, and benefits, uh, again, I mentioned earlier, it's the same rate as a regular membership. Um, and the benefits, uh, dedicated section on the COPA website, you'll have uh, quarterly safety seminars because um, uh, probably, uh, I'm not sure if it's part of um, Transport Canada's presentation, but there is a 24 month recurrency training for advanced uh, uh, pilot certificates. Um, so we'll be offering those. And uh, we'll have uh, dedicated COPA guides uh, we'll have dedicated articles in our weekly e-flight and our uh, COPA flight magazine. Um, every uh, member has uh, can get a copy, a physical copy of the COPA flight magazine if they request it. Um, of course, our advocacy efforts will be now uh, geared towards both piloted and remotely piloted um, aircraft operations. Um, we have... Um, through Pull Employee Benefits, which is a benefits management company. Uh, they provide health and dental plans for our COPA members. They also provide incredible emergency travel and medical insurance program. One of the best in, 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 the, uh, in the country. We have home and auto group insurance for those who don't, uh, don't benefit from that from uh, you know, their employment. Uh, BMO COPA MasterCard program, preferred rates on car rentals and hotel bookings. We have discounts on clothing, coffee, survival kits. There's tons more. You have to go to our website to look at all the benefits that we get. And we're constantly working on, on, on getting new benefits for our members. We're constantly working on this page. Some of the timelines we're looking at, obviously yesterday was our initial launch of the program, which included uh, the insurance and the training. Um, we're having our first drone seminar, which is today. We're going to have oh, several workshops at our virtual national fly-in. So if you haven't registered yet for that, please do. I'll talk a little bit more about it in, in, a, few, in a few minutes. And of course, uh, starting in July 2021, we're going to be launching several educational guides and more material that, are, that will be geared towards the uh, drone operator. And, uh, you know, one of the most important things that we've been able to secure is uh, our past scholarships. And that's going to be uh, to support pilot development. Um, and the scholarship is really targeted at pilots who have been affected by the uh, pandemic, who have been furloughed, who have lost their jobs, and who might not be, um, who, who might not want to return to, uh, you know, that part of the uh, aviation world. So this initiative is really to help retain their skills and their talents uh, of aviation and within this sector. And of course, uh, you know, our upcoming event is the uh, COPE Virtual National Fly-In and Aviation Expo. It is on June 27th, 2021. It's the first time ever that COPA is hosting a virtual seminar. Uh, lots of um, lots of planned, um, uh, there's going to be seminars, there's going to be talks, there's going to be workshops. Uh, some of them will be geared directly for drone um, operations. We're going to have the Edmonton and Villeneuve Airport talk to us about their drone operations. We are going to be hosting a pilot recurrent training for drone pilots. And uh, of course, uh, there's going to be a talk on best practices for transitioning from traditional to remote aviation. So if you haven't registered um, and you are a member, it's only $15 right now. It's it's an uh, early bird fee. and, and for those who are not members, we do have discounts uh, for, for you to include with a membership. Um, otherwise, it is $35 to, to register if you're not a member and you don't want a membership. Uh, and $5 of every registration actually goes to our Freedom to Fly Fund, which helps us um, 
continue with our advocacy, advocacy efforts. So I welcome everybody to join this community of 15,000 plus flying into enthusiasts. Uh, you know, COPA uh, is able to provide you the, the community and the resources to enhance your flying experience. We're already a trusted leader in advancing and promoting aviation, uh, you know, with a focus on safety. We're the uh, long recognized voice of general aviation in Canada. So we're uniquely positioned to represent both the traditional and the remote, remote aircraft pilot. Um, and a key objective in uniting these two communities together to form one uh, healthy community is, is our efforts for the safe integration of all airspace users. So traditional and remote aircraft pilots share common interests, both in safety and in protecting uh, their freedom to fly. And, uh, you know, COPA is, is quite happy to, uh, to be doing that on, on their behalf. Um, je vais le, le, uh, donc, uh, j'espère que vous avez aimé la présentation. Que si vous avez des questions, vous pouvez toujours envoyer des messages à la COPA. Mais je vous invite à rejoindre une communauté de plus de 15 000 passionnés de vol. Um, Nous, vous euh, nous souhaitons améliorer votre expérience de vol en vous fournissant une communauté euh, passionnée ainsi que les ressources. Nous, autres, nous sommes un leader renommé dans l'aviation générale au Canada. Nous voulons unir les deux communautés et n'en faire une seule, car nous partageons un intérêt commun pour la sécurité et la protection de notre liberté de voler. Donc, bienvenue à bord et nous espérons vraiment de tous vous revoir très bientôt. So that's, uh, so yeah, that's it for my presentation. Um, welcome aboard everyone. And we truly hope to see all of you very soon. Thank you so much, Christine. That was fantastic. I really appreciate um, you breaking down what's included in that membership, but it got me thinking of something for someone like myself who has a COPA membership and obviously has an interest in the RPAS side of things too. How does that work moving forward? Do I need to sign up for another RPAS membership? Um, how, how Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Your your regular COPA membership entitles you to all of the benefits of the RPAS um, material. Um, everything that we do for the RPAS uh, community is 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 uh, available to our regular uh, members and and vice versa. So everything uh, you know, if you sign up for an RPAS membership, you have access to all of the other things that a regular membership would 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 entitle you to. So it's just one price, and you get everything. You get everything from traditional side and for correct. Oh, that's yeah, great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, wonderful. And so, do you see this our past membership working well for? I'm thinking like the range of drone operators, our past pilots that we have. You know, this someone who bought their um, 249 gram micro drone at Best Buy and wants to fly to the person who's flying commercially every day for their job. Um, how does do you see it working for kind of both or that whole spectrum? Yeah, the same way that we we represent a wide spectrum of of, of traditional aviators, we will be representing the wide spe spectrum of our pass operators as well. Um, you know, we we want to we want to sit at the table with Transport Canada and Nav Canada, and and we want to be part of those conversations for all of the uh, our drone operators, whether they be commercial or or uh, whether they be um, recreational. Of course, our focus is always going to be on on um, you know safety a safe integration and keeping it affordable, not just for manned aircraft, but for also, you know, uh, remotely piloted aircraft um, it, it, on both sides. It has to be equitable. And that's that's really where our focus is going to be. Okay. Yeah, because I can see um, um, I can see that insurance piece being really valuable um, even for operational operators because they, you know, they're still flying over properties and if there's any incident that could be that could be really useful as well so that's that's great yeah to hear. there's there's a lot of things that m maybe the the recreational drone oper operator is not aware of uh, not just in terms of regulation and not just in terms of flying into uh, controlled airspace but uh, you know the insurance piece what are you liable for when you're flying your drone over, over somebody else's property or uh, you know, over a shopping mall or, you know, there's, there's, um, and, and we want to be that voice of education for, for, for them. Excellent. Yeah. I think it's, it's really valuable to have, um, an organization like COPA to amplify the messages that are coming from Transport Canada and coming from Canada and other interest groups, even best practices too. 
So yep. that's that's great. Um, one more question for you before we um, switch gears here a little bit. I can imagine that some might be concerned with seeing this as COPA splitting their focus. Um, how would you address that? Just so, like integrating our pass into things, is that going to detract from what COPA has been doing over the, the past decades? So that very good question, Kate. I, I think that is something that um, uh, you know our members ask every time we introduce a new program, no matter no matter what the program is. Um, will that will that take some resources away from from say our our advocacy work? Um, absolutely not. To me, introducing a COPA a, a, a program into the COPA family is really uh, about introducing a new child. So if you're a parent and you have you know two children, you don't split your attention between the two. You don't split your love between the two you actually make more time you do find that time and and you do you you just make them more love so for, for every copa program that we have it's like a child in the copa family we just find more time and we just make more love so we will definitely not be forgetting about everything else that we've been doing we're just going to be doing more i love it and there's and I think a lot of complementary pieces to it as well so i see it kind of jiving together especially as we see applications and 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 things grow and how the like regulatory body is incorporating um incorporating things together so exactly that's my not so subtle segue into our next presentation um so i'd like to invite uh jeremy to get uh to get his slides ready to go and we're going to um invite the um a bit of a regulatory overview from jeremy um at transport canada give us a bit of a perspective here. And um, please keep continuing to pop questions into the chat if you have anything that comes up that you'd like to see addressed. We'll uh, do our best to incorporate those at the end of the presentations. And with that, Jeremy, it's all you. Thanks, thanks so much, Kate. And, uh, and Christine, uh, grateful to have the opportunity to follow you here. Um, like I said, a longstanding member of COPA, always looked up to the president for, for guidance and support and certainly never failed in that regard. Um, and now the uh, additional support COPA will bring to um, to the RPAS world, which is which is fantastic. So, looking forward to how we, uh, we we get more information from stakeholders, how that information comes in, because we do have a mandate here, obviously, to represent Canadians uh, in this new realm. So, uh, getting on with that, I think I've given you the background, and I have seen some questions come up with the uh, the chat, and I'll try to answer them at the end of my um, spiel here but I won't be seeing the chat as I go through. So I'm sure we'll get that through other means. Um, so kicking off, um, let's, uh, let's just quick, quickly move on here. So new, role, new roles came in in 2019. Now really, what did, we have, uh, what did we have before? Well, we had the other parts of the cars. Uh, they are drones or an aircraft, which I'll, I'll go through a bit more on that. We had to uh, enact a bunch of exemptions. We certainly had a lot of special flight operations certificates that were required. Uh, quite a huge number really to get the whole gambit of everything going. Um, and uh, so when part nine came into effect, uh, it did a huge amount of work to um, simplify the processes, uh, enhance innovation, because obviously you're not going through that uh, laborious uh, flight op special flight operations certificate uh, requirement every time you're trying to do what was becoming routine drone operations. Um, and so we're really listening to Canadians as much as we could um, and breaking it down so that you could fly over people, near people, um, and in controlled airspace, for example, uh, without always having to go back to uh, what, is this, what are the specific authorizations um, required through Transport Canada. So those new rules came into force on June 1st, 2019, after quite a consultation period, consultation period and really, um, although I wasn't part of this program at the time, I do know that the original um, proposed amendments that came out went under quite a, bit of, quite a bit of review and consultation, quite a bit of change. And as you'll see, as I get to the awards, the end of my uh, presentation, I'll be happy to speak to the changes that are coming up. So the foundation, uh, click my notes as well. There we go. So yeah, like I said, a drone is an aircraft. And if you take that drone and add a control station, command and control links, then you get what we term a remotely piloted aircraft system, which is deliberately named uh, without gender. Uh, regulations uh, do not distinguish ours do between commercial and recreational at this point. Um, and rules, certainly, we are we are talking about drones under 25 kilograms. 
and the majority of the regulation is geared for the drones that are 250 grams and above. Uh, it is clear that when you fly a drone, certainly you are a pilot. Quickly about micro drones. This is still an aircraft. It is still regulated to a much less degree than the other ones. So there's a bit of a misunderstanding on that. Um, certainly you must not operate it in a way that does not pose a dangerous set on, set on the slide. So think reckless and negligent. The cars are clear. It is uh, regulated under the Canadian Aviation Regulations from that perspective. And that's pretty broad and important, right? Um, something else to think about. Uh, so it's in line also with what you'll see in the United States. Uh, they didn't just, Mavic Minis or Mavic didn't just build drones that were 249 grams for the Canadian market. Um, however, if you do take a micro drone and you add any weight to it, do be aware, like even if you put the regular drone guard or the um, propeller guards on it, it's suddenly over 250 grams and jumps up into the uh, a category that must be registered. I'll talk a little bit about basic operations. So we have, a, we have um, the basic operations environment, um, so I, I spoke about micro drones, but with what is regulated specifically are the basic operations environment, the advanced operations environment, and then beyond that through special authorizations. So this is the first operational level rating. Uh, looking at the slide, you've got the weights that were the, the masses that we're talking about. If we do talk about bystanders, we're talking about anybody who's not involved in the operation. We're not talking about the crew or visual observers or people specifically trained. Um, it's, uh, you, will, you will stay out of uh, controlled airspace, certainly it's only an uncontrolled airspace, below 400 feet. You do need to keep it within visual line of sight as per all our regulations, uh, the regular, regu the, the, uh, the, uh, the non-special authorization regulations at the moment. Um, you have to keep it away from airports, three nautical miles, a nautical mile from heliports, and always, as, as always, steer clear of other air traffic. You can fly 100 feet over buildings, but you have to stay within 100 feet of the top and 200 feet of, feet of the sides. And happy to go over these again, all of it's available within uh, within CARS Part 9, which is not a long chapter. Um, you do need to be 14 years old. And then how do you go about getting it? It's pretty simple. Um, as always, and as Christine is going through right now, we do recommend that you get specific training. There's drone specific information that is very useful for you, although the other knowledge areas will be quite familiar to are folks who are already pilots. You write an exam, you register the drone, and you get your pilot certificate. I'll talk about the, the management portal that does that for you. But um, like the knowledge requirements, uh, the, the, the requirements for this type of an operation, as all the operations, you're still talking about air law, traffic law, airframes, power plant. You'll, you'll be very familiar from the, uh, the traditional pilot side, human factors, uh, weather, navigation, flight operations, theory of flight, radio telephony, um, this is what the regulations have brought, right? The ability to, to check and, and really bring in. Now, the focus with our basic operations is really on the educational side. We want people to get involved, um, embrace as many people as we can and get them educated. Moving on to advanced operations. So the way we like to think of it is near people, over people and in controlled airspace. That's, what, that's our mantra on that. So what does that mean? Well, it means less than 30 meters or from horizontally or over top of bus standards. It means working in controlled airspace. Now, um, you're not going to be using the same drones for this. You'll go to the list of drones that the manufacturers have specifically uh, declared have um, the against the standards that are the Transport Canada standards that say, we meet the requirements to fly near people, but not over people, or we meet the requirements to fly over people, or we meet the requirements to fly within controlled airspace in accordance with an authorization from NAV Canada or, uh, or ATC. Let's see what else I've got here. Um, again, people under the age of, uh, so this is the, the minimum age here is 16. Um, if you are younger than that for any of these operations, you can fly a uh, drone still under the, supervision of, uh, under the supervision of someone who's qualified. And if you do wanna go ahead and get your advanced operation certificate, um, you could do so without your basic. You uh, you can go straight to it. Again, uh, training is certainly advised. Um, it is uh, it is uh, it is uh, quite a bit more involved. It does involve the same knowledge areas, but to uh, a, a quite a bit um, a much greater extent. So you pass your exam. 
um, online, which will be done, uh, and you get your results right away. Then you need to find yourself a flight reviewer who will be associated with a flight school. And there you'll go through a practical application of what you've learned and what you know. And once you've shown that and you pass your flight review, um, you, you'll already have registered your drone, of course, and then you get your certificate as soon as you go online to the drone management portal, which again, I'll, I'll speak more to in a moment. Well, not too much to say here. Um, this one comes up a lot, so uh, we figure we'll, uh, we'll pop it up and, and give you some of the information. And if you're following the, uh, um, the, the progress in the United States, they're, they're catching up to us on, on some of these factors. I'm a little proud of that. Um, I, I add the flight planning tools. So as you get more into it, the drone site selection tool is uh, a tool that was produced by the, uh, by the NRC National Resource, Resource, uh, Research Council, sorry, in collaboration certainly with our, our folks at, at TC and using a lot of the data um, that we already know from the existing publications in aviation. Um, so we use this, I still use this uh, quite extensively. What you're looking at now is a representation of where you could fly with a basic, um, uh, a basic certification, i.e. low level, outside of controlled airspace, um, away from restricted areas, um, and then with some additional information available to with regards to where you would fly in and around aerodromes as opposed to airports being certified or not. Um, and so these types of these types of tools have been very useful, although they are only tools, of course, you go back to the drone pilots as they would. They would go back to NOTAMs, they go to back to your, your uh, flight supplement, your designated airspace handbook, just as a, as a pilot should. Sorry, catching up on my other slides as well. There we go. Happy to speak about the drone management portal because if there's something that I'm really uh, excited about what drones have offered is that it's this ability to leap, leapfrog ahead and get um, and, and drag the rest of the process along with it. So with this portal, you can come in, you can register your drone, you can take your exams, you can get your pilot certification. And for instance, if you're gonna do it at the basic level, you could do all of this within uh, a very short time frame and immediately pay for what you've done I think it's $5. I'd have to go back and check um, what all the payment levels are for, but there they are minimal fees for what you're doing. Um, and it's quite a powerful tool that the rest of Transport Canada is taking a very close look at uh, because, of, because of the success of what's, what's occurred. So uh, pretty proud of what has been accomplished by the, uh, the RPAS task force within Transport Canada and, and how we brought along the drone management portal. Uh, a bit of a jump back to the flying side again, actually. Um, so this is what we have to be uh, quite mindful of for our drone pilot. So obviously we have to keep your drone within visual line of sight. Um, sometimes that gets forgotten as you're staring at your screen and, uh, and that's not capable of being done with a first person viewer device. Happy to talk about that later if required. Um, you do stay below 400 feet. Uh, that is where traditional aviation is found less, but do understand, we recognize that there is traditional aviation in that space as well. Um, you do have to stay outside of controlled airspace unless, as I mentioned, you are have an advanced certificate, you have a safety assured drone by the manufacturer and you get your NAV Canada and ATC and or, sorry, or ATC um, authorization. And that would be through an online portal. And I know that Alan will be happy to tell you more about the NAV drone app, which we'll be looking to consolidate a lot of these uh, these resources together. So we're also quite excited to see that. Uh, stay away from airports and heliports unless you have the advanced operations to do so and carry out the other conditions and steer clear of other air traffic. Um, it is a requirement to do a site survey and a site, your whole operational site, not just where you take off and land, but uh, and helicopter pilots will be quite used to this and in going into areas that are not defined aerodromes. So you do need to be aware of your environment, including airspace in this case. Um, there is a regulatory requirement to keep your doc documents and records with you. You can keep them there electronically and you are to stay away from emergency situations. Um, um, and certainly you would think of police services, first responders, as well as been in some incidents with that and, um, and advertised events, which I can speak to a little bit more in a couple slides coming up. Okay, there are not just the aviation regulations that are involved with this. 
Um, people say, people will call us, uh, somebody was looking at me and I don't want them looking at me. Though there are laws against this. There is the Privacy Act, Personal Information Protection, Electronic Documents Act. Um, there, all of these are still in play. Um, I saw some questions about uh, bylaws, et cetera, and I can maybe speak to that towards the end if that question comes up. But Car Parks Canada can limit, they own the, if they own the land, they can limit who takes off and lands within their national parks as any private property owner can do. Um, and you should be aware of the, of the other acts, especially if you're working with wildlife or marine mammals. Okay, how are the rules enforced? A little bit unique with our pass, and I think only in a positive way. Uh, what is not unique is that Transport Canada inspectors mm -hmm. can go out and enforce the aviation regulations as they always have. Um, there are some delegated um, authorities that have come from the minister to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and specifically delegated municipal and I should add provincial police forces. And this grows by the week and other police force will get in touch with us saying we're having some issues. We would like this delegation. They can go out and issue um, administrative monetary penalties. They can issue fines for drone operators under the cars. Um, and, you know, they're not, they're not to be um, they're like thousand to 25,000 per infraction. That's a, it's a fairly big deal, right? So we take it seriously. And um, um, it's, uh, it's been going, it's certainly an ongoing process. And I'll say right now, we're just, we're just putting out new policy on how that can be better handled in the future. Uh, also benefit of having police forces manage some of this, uh, some of these aspects is that they can quite quickly switch to the criminal code should that be applicable under um, under the uh, the points limited or listed there. Okay, what about SFOCs? Um, so really interesting to people who were around flying drones before 2019 because this is how they did a lot of it. And here's a couple of examples of where you would need a special flight operations certificate. If you have a larger drone than is uh, normally regulated under part nine, if you're over advertised events, if you wanna fly over 400 feet, um, I'll add a couple more here because I think they're important. Certainly, if you wanna fly before, beyond visual line of sight, that's a big one, you'll, uh, you'll need to go through the process. Uh, Non-Canadian citizens, um, if you're gonna be carrying any dangerous or hazardous payloads, and, and a final one that's still in place at the moment is uh, flying anywhere near uh, military airports. Um, and I'll just, I'll add another point perhaps because uh, yes, it's so that you can fly your bigger drone in areas that are not normally covered under the cars. Um, no, sorry, they are covered in, under the requirement for an SFOC, of course. Um, but we, it's a good place to set a reminder that we do have development framework in Canada that is somewhat unique. We do have ranges out in, uh, in Alma, Quebec and foremost Alberta, where we do a lot of, uh, we do see a lot of our technological development work uh, come to pass. Um, not to mention our unrestricted airspace that allows for these types of operations. So we we are playing a bit of a leadership role and do intend on continuing that with uh, getting in a, getting ahead in the innovation space. Okay, getting towards the end of my presentation here. So where are we going? And I, I'm mentioning here the notice of uh, proposed amendment that went out last year. So that's um, that's our official, and it is still our official offering to uh, to the public on what we plan to do. But I'll be honest, I haven't spent a whole lot of time on it because there's been so much stakeholder conversation that has come in. And I'm focused on where stakeholders have noted, noted that we wanna go, where industry says, and where the government of Canada believes is the next step. So, uh, but the overall intent has not really changed. We want to expand the VLOS envelope into larger drones. Um, we will be offering the ability to conduct lower risk VV loss operations, which is unique on a global scale. I won't say we're the first in the world because uh, I haven't gotten in checked, but you know, we're certainly ahead of many, including our, our good friends to the south and being able to shortly offer VV loss operations that, have, uh, that are of a lower risk nature. Um, and as we've uh, liked to discuss in the, in the past, we focus on the pilot, the product and the procedures. So we are looking at introducing a new operational level rating. So I talked about the basic and the advanced. We are looking at, so there'll be an increase in age and there is now going to be mandatory training required. Um, we are going to be tightening up the uh, manufacturer declare declaration uh, procedures that are currently in place, calling it declaration plus because of the fact that Transport Canada 
um, is uh, there's a validation ahead of time perspective to this uh, that will uh, that we'll be following. When we do look at the procedures, we're introducing things such as not just uh, beyond visual line of sight BV loss that you'd normally think of as the drone goes far away from you into a distant location. We're also talking about the realtor that needs to get to the other side of the building um, and and how that can be done safely and with what uh, with what types of restrictions or what we're taking the information in on now. Um, we do uh, recognize the need for increasing standoff distances from people for the larger systems. Um, and uh, we are still focused at the moment on keeping those uh, BB loss beyond visual line of sight operations below, sorry, below 400 feet AGL and truly in sparsely populated areas. Although of course they're not, uh, it's not just the people on the ground that, uh, that are potentially at risk. Another large part of the, uh, the notice of pr proposed amendment that work continues on is the RPAS operator certificate. And this is not to be confused with another pilot certificate, although that is part of the operational level rating. Um, this is more in the vein of, um, of up to typical AOC that transport has th thought of in the past. We're thinking of systems that are there to, um, to increase risk management, work on continuous improvement, identify people who are accountable and identify systems, processes, and procedures that are scaled to the size of the organization. So less onerous, onerous on the smaller organizations, more so on the larger ones. Um, and that's the, uh, and we are just sort of getting really into the meat of that and look forward to presenting that um, uh, at CG1. So where we are right now, and I'll explain a little bit about that. So um, obviously the notice of proposed, or not me, perhaps not so obviously, the notice of proposed amendment, that was the basic idea of where we wanted to go came out last year. And we got a lot of feedback on that and we are in the midst of incorporating that into what we wanna present again for the next consultation at Canada Gazette One, which we hope to have out by the end of this year, at which time there will be a few months for Canadians to then and stakeholders to respond back and say, okay, you took the NPA, you responded to us or you didn't, and this is what we want to see changed. And we do have to address every one of the comments. Um, so that'll be coming at, towards the end of this year. And then once we've received all the stakeholder comments on our tightened up proposal, then we'll be going to uh, issuing it at Canada Gazette 2, at which become time it becomes uh, into law. And really, if you look at this, and this is another way that, that drones have really um, forged forged a, a path for, for Canada and aviation in Canada. Um, like when was the last time that a whole part was added to the Canadian aviation regulations? It's been quite some time, I believe it was the safety management system and how quickly these regulations that came into effect in 2019, what, two years, and how quickly we're gonna do it again. And so within the RPAS task force, we're a multidisciplinary cross-functional um, uh, team. We've got uh, policy working alongside engineers, working alongside operators and pilots and technicians and AIT um, with a lot of success. So, uh, and that is being noticed. And we do hope that that will translate to the other areas of CIVAB um, for to, where we've been able to show efficiencies and, and been able to make process quickly or progress quickly. Um, in the, sorry, I'll, I'll switch here and we can get into the questions. The, um, I'm trying to remember the two that I saw in the chat because I haven't been following along as you've been going. I'm sure there's going to be more. Somebody had asked about underground operations and whether that was going to be regulated. If you are inside or if you are underground, then you're not in Canadian airspace. So um, simply, no, if you're flying a drone through a mine, then uh, this, the aviation regulations will not be there to regulate you. It'll be under the other, um, the other portions, which would still be in effect, not under the cars. Um, but, uh, you know, and uh, what was the other question? And it's um, people, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at property owners, certainly own the property. And if you are out flying, you should always go out and get a, a permission before you take off or land on anybody's property, no doubt. Uh, but uh, airspace is certainly the, the realm of the aviation regulations. Um, in closing here, and happy to take questions or, or however we're going to go about that. Um, Really proud to be a part of this, excited to be a part of this. I, this is going to be the future. Um, and it's not here to replace traditional aviation. It's here to, uh, uh, to, um, to uh, certainly there's an integration aspect, but when I look at how quickly my son got involved in drones compared to how quickly he's gonna be able to get involved in traditional aviation, uh, I'm excited about 
his level of knowledge before I take him up um, on his first flight lesson, um, which I look forward to. So, uh, and then when we look at the innovation side and the work with industry, I just, I don't know where else we've been able to achieve this kind of um, um, uh, sort of synchronous effect. So thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this. It's it's great to be with these other esteemed people on the panel and and the moderator, Kate, obviously as well. And I'll leave it there for, for questions. Over to you, Kate. All right, folks, I seem to be back. I apologize, my audio dropped off at the end there. Um, so I, uh, you can hear me now. Are we we back? Things seem to be working. Okay, that's good. I hope I didn't miss anything. Too yeah, better. all good. I was ready to step in. So I'm <laughs> glad you're back. <laughs> um, I apologize because Jeremy, I missed the, the last um, the last things you said up on this question slide. Um, things were gradually going downhill for my audio, and I wasn't sure if it was on my end or yours. But it seems to be working now. Um, would you be willing to do a rapid fire? question and answer because uh to no shock to anyone you got a lot of questions <laughs> yeah um so i will try to keep them short and sweet stick to the regulations where i can and understand that in this forum um we'll we'll try to get through as many of the questions as we can and let's see how flexible i am and how quickly i've picked up tc regulations in the last seven months okay and if you do want to phone a friend i am willing to be that friend because there's a few of them that uh that I have experience with from my side of the industry. So let's awesome. take a look. Um, you touched a little bit on how TC is enforcing uh, the rules in general. What about certification specifically? Um, what, how is that, that being addressed? Um, so there's gonna be, I have to be careful when I talk about my own opinion and I'll try to keep it quickly. There's gonna be things that are gonna be certified. Right when you're talking about large drones operating completely integrated in high-level airspace, which um, and if anybody's tracking, uh, Aircraft Services Division of Transport Canada has bought an aircraft that'll be delivered in the next two years, and this aircraft is going to be operating in an ADSB transport bonder environment, and maybe Alan can speak to that. There's going to be levels of certification required. How we're going to do that? How the National Aircraft Certification Branch of TC is going to work on it? Um, certainly. Uh, all of that has not been ironed out, but certification is coming. I just can't tell you where that line uh, will be drawn. Okay, sounds good. Um, looking at um, micro drones, what area of the cars is it specifically that addresses just those ones of part nine? It's so uh, nine zero 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 six is the uh, is the main one. No person shall operate a remotely piloted aircraft system in such a reckless and negligent manner as to endanger or be likely to endanger. So aviation, so reckless and negligent, and then endanger aviation safety, so aircraft in the air and people on the ground. That's pretty broad. Um, and uh, and before that, of course, an R-Pass is an aircraft. So, but typically 90006 at the beginning of part nine of the cars. Okay, fantastic. For those, um, According to our poll, we have 52% of the group here that is coming from the traditional side of aviation. Um, how would those folks go about pursuing an RPAS certification? Is there any grandfathering that's in, in place? Um, how does that process work for someone who already holds a pilot license to get their, their drone pilot certification? So if you, if you have a pilot's license, then you don't automatically get uh, an operator certificate, um, but you are grandfathered from the perspective of the we are we're building on what we know. The information is validated based on the traditional aviation concepts that we've had in the past. Although we do try to keep an open mind, so how can you go about and do it? Well, I switched. I've got a um, uh, an ATPLH CPLA, um, so uh, a strong traditional aviation background. All of that is relevant. It all matters, except maybe my understanding of electrical energy and quadcopter or dynamics. So um, um, how would you go about it? You would uh, do what Christine's doing and, and, and follow drone school. Although um, you do hold, uh, you already as a private pilot, your level of knowledge of understanding of the basic knowledge requirements of aviation is already above and beyond what you will need for what, what I think for basic and advanced operations. So none of this should seem like a big, big hill to climb. The cost is not that much, especially for the registration, but you go in for basic, you do the exam, you register your drone, you get your certificate, you're in and you're out. Um, with 
you know, again, we do recommend, although it isn't mandatory at this time that the training be involved. Um, and then for the advanced, the only addition of uh, is the flight review. So go through each of those steps and note that everything that you can do with an electronic flight book or for flight, like I used on my, it is on my flight review, it is all relevant. Everything you know is relevant. So no, it is not grandfathered, but yes, the information you've had in the past will make it uh, relatively and actually uh, quite an easy transition for you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. There, you know, there are those those kind of gaps that exist. You know, MET still is MET, and a lot of the navigation concepts stay the same. But looking at propulsion systems that are now completely electric, or like lithium polymer batteries, what are the, what are the dynamics around those that you need to understand? So there are still going to be some gaps. So, um, so yeah, I think that's great. So they would need to um, write the exam, either basic or advanced. Um, do their flight review if they're going to go for advanced. It's the same process. And I think it's only $10 to write the exam. So if someone's like, ah, maybe I'll take a look at this, it's not like they're going to be, you know, flushing $150 down if they're, if they just want to test it out and see how they can do, uh, how they do with the exam. Yeah, you wait 24 hours and you go back in and you write it the next day. Um, you know, you know um, I, 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 he hasn't told me I could share his name, but um, there is a 16 year old that just went out and passed the advanced exam on his first try and he has no, he's not a pilot doesn't have any traditional aviation experience. So these are these these hills, the advanced exam is more in depth, there's no doubt, but it is completely manageable, especially if you have an aviation background. Yeah, for sure, I agree with that. Um, I agree with you as well with the drone, drone management portal, how seamless that has worked. Um, there's been very few hiccups um, that I've experienced with it, um, considering how much of a change that has been from how TC has done things in the past with exams. Um, and the other thing that I like pointing out um, that I think is a really brilliant move on TC's part is the way that they have structured um, when you write the advanced exam, you're also issued a basic certification right away. And that allows the pilot to go out and get familiar with the aircraft, work through their checklists before they move into the advanced certification doing the flight review, because that is you really as a flight reviewer um, want to see the whole operation come together. So it's great that there's that. Um, ability for someone to who's pursuing an advanced because it's not like it's a prerequisite. You don't have to do basic before you do advanced. You can roll right into the advanced um, so they can go out and, and build skill in low risk environments before they're expecting to, to understand how it all comes together to operate in complex areas. Um, you touched a little bit um, actually along that note um, and Christine, this may, you may want to jump in on this one too. Um, for the folks that have been operating model aircraft um, through MAC, the Model Aeronautics Association of Canada, how does this drone certification requirement tie into anything that's happening with, with MAC? I'll let I you go can, first, Jeremy, and then. Yeah, I think so. I'll, I can give you what I've read. I've got a, remo a remote control modeler and I'll keep it tight because I think maybe Christine has something to offer on this. Uh, there's currently an exemption in place uh, if you fly from MAC airfields under MAC rules and go through the exemption and you'll see basically you need to be a member in good standing doing everything that MAC requires. Um, you are exempt from part nine and they go through, um, uh, they go through and we've looked at the process of what they do and how they do it and said that that works. Um, the expansion of this, and this might be in Alan's realm as well, is that if your MAC airfield is within controlled airspace, that you need an agreement with uh, with NAV Canada. So there's some conversations and, and ongoing work with that. Um, although, you know what? It's not that onerous to go out and get your basic and advanced certificate. So on some, you can go, it is much more onerous. If you want to do the, the more work and you're a great RC modeler because they are great you know, they've, they've done a lot of work and they have great programs and you can go through that aspect. But um, the uh, I would I would recommend, and I would recommend to a Mac model, if, uh, and that's what I've seen from the Mac people I know, they have both to be able to, uh, to operate, not just in that way. Um, I'll, I'll pause there in case anybody else wants to jump in. No, I, do, I don't really have, I think you, you've touched on, uh, on, on, I think uh, a lot of the concerns that some, some people had. Um, I think you said it very well. I really don't have anything to add to that. Cause I can see how, um, if you're, if you hold a Mac, um, if you're a member of Mac that like where the, where the overlap with COPA and Mac might be, like why the COPA membership might still be of interest would be if you're planning on operating outside of Mac airfields at all. 
you would be able to access insurance coverage beyond what's available when you're operating as part of like a Mac sanctioned event or at a Mac sanctioned field. So, okay, that's great. All right, yeah, keeping an eye on the time. This, I'll go ahead. Just, just to add to that a little bit. So from NavCandor's perspective, yeah, we continue, we continue to work with TC and with Mac um, around agreements that need to be in place for, for work outside the field. So um, yeah, that's, that's work that's still underway to make sure it's uh, executed safely. Excellent. Very good. And Alan, it's great to hear your voice. So this is a good segue to, to bring you in. I'm keeping an eye on the time too. I want to make sure we have time to hit you with a bunch of questions as well. So I'll invite you to get your slides uh, set up there. And um, I'm really excited to hear more about the Nav Drone app. Highly anticipated Nav Drone app. <laughs> Over Thank to you. you. Thank you very much. And it's um. It's great to be able to present. Uh, I don't often get the uh, the introduction of the regulations and everything uh, so well uh, so well outlined. So it's great to have that as the foundation for going into this uh, to go into this presentation. So yeah, what I'll uh, what I'll cover today um, is a little bit about the background. Again, great great context set up for that from the other speakers today. Um, I'll talk about our approach to RTM and all the things that we're looking at here. But I'm going to focus today mainly on Nav Drone and introduce Nav Drone uh, as a topic to people. Uh, we still plan to launch this spring, um, so we'll we'll uh, give you some insights and show you what that looks like. I'll finish off with drone safety again, critical for I think everybody um, uh, you know on the on the meeting today, and then uh, just touch on the future of RTM and again some of the some of those aspects as well that Jeremy touched on today. So we'll walk through that. Okay, so let's start off with the uh, the background. So um, here we go. So you know you heard uh, you heard about some of these uh, areas, and particularly when we look at the market, this number is really hard to get to. But we we think from the modelling that we've done, there's something like 200 to 300,000 RPAs in Canada uh, uh, right now, and we know that there's close to 60,000 of those registered under under the latest numbers. So you know we're uh, we're kind of creeping up there in terms of those numbers number of registrations, but there still continues to be that gap, you know, and this is. This is an area where organizations like COPA and our other stakeholders can help us make sure that we're getting the word out, people are understanding the regulations, um, because it's critical that you know, we have more of those drones certified and you know, people following the regulations, clearly. Um, there's also, so uh, again, Jeremy touched on the certification process. There are, there's well over 50,000 pilots registered, and of those, there's about 5,000 now that, have, that hold that advanced certification. And in 2020, those 5,000 pilots uh, requested 21,000 um, uh, permissions to access controlled airspace. So that's, a, that's also a number that's growing significantly. So when we talk about the rest of aviation kind of being depressed through, uh, through the pandemic, um, the, uh, the RPAS industry uh, certainly didn't slow down. And in fact, this year, if I compare March 2021 to March 2020, we're seeing, we saw in March a 91% increase in the number of authorizations. And I'll talk about the automation that we're, we're putting into NavDrone to help both pilots and us, frankly, in, in terms of managing that workload, uh, which is getting significant. So this is, so given that's the background, this is NavCanda's commitment. And we've, we've heard the term used a couple of times uh, by different people uh, on, uh, on this, that we want access to airspace to be equitable. Um, we want the operating environment to be efficient. Um, and we know that the systems that we need for RPAS are going to be different to how we manage ATM. You know, they're smaller, the volume's much higher. We can't manage drones in the same way as we do the rest of our ATM um, and traditional aviation. So we're putting new systems in place and services and nav drone, uh, which I'll talk about later, is, is the first of those. I mentioned at the start, one of the first things I was brought in to do was really to uh, look broadly at the strategy for NAV Canada and, and, and understand all the areas that we needed to be involved in. And that ranged from um, drone safety to operations and some of the, the advanced topics, including research and trials and service provision. I'll talk through, I'll give you a little bit of a, um, an insight into each of those. But underpinning all those things, one of the things that we recognize is the importance of stakeholders and stakeholder bodies like COPA and others in the industry that will really help guide this work and make sure that we do this work in a safe ma manner. Um, the four pillars above that, so 
talk about drone safety. You know, we are very um, concerned, of course, with particularly around airports, uh, incursion activities. We've all heard the stories of things that happen in Gatwick and other places. We don't want to be, we don't want to have Canada's name on that list of, uh, of issues that have affected the economy and the airport authorities and potentially put people's lives at risk. So we, we do a lot of work around that. I'll talk more about that at the end. Um, awareness and education is key here. Again, getting getting word out about the both the regulations, awareness of, of airspace, all of those activities. So drone safety is our number one uh, focus here. We've got an operations team that works alongside uh, Jeremy's team, not only to implement the regulations, to guide our FIRs and our units uh, in what they need to do, but also to look to the future and look at new regulations that are coming up and giving NAV Canada's perspective uh, into those regulations. So that, that team supports all of that work that goes on. And there are lots of questions that both Transport Canada, the industry and NAV Canada are all working to, to answer, to understand. This work's being done not just in Canada, but we are focused on the Canadian context and what's different for us um, as, we, as we look out um, in, in terms of what needs to be implemented. But you know, internationally, we look at the governing bodies, we look at the work of ICAO and we're on those boards, you know, the standards organizations that are working and our peer ANSPs to, again, look at re research and trials uh, that are going on. And then all of those things culminate in service provision. It means that we bring new services uh, to the aviation industry. Um, when the regulations first went in place in 2019, we put in place a very simple form that allowed people to identify where they wanted to fly, all the criteria that were requested as part of Car Part 9, um, and then uh, that was uh, those requests were then all manually handled uh, within Nav Canada. And so what we're moving towards is a fully, you know, is a is a system that allows us to manage that workflow, manage those requests, but give a lot more benefits uh, back to pilots as well. So that's our overall strategy um, of where uh, where Nav Canada is heading towards. So let me move into into Nav Drone uh, right now and talk a little bit about that. So again, to start with, work closely with our stakeholders on this, with both uh, aviation industry, Transport Canada, and others to make sure that all the work that we do, all these services that we're providing, not only fit the regulations, keep the airspace safe, uh, but really give us a good platform uh, to continue this development of RTM on. The current application as it's been built, is built for the regulations today. So that's VLOS, Visual Line of Sight. Again, Jeremy spoke about that. Pilots or observers have to keep their uh, drones in sight at all time on their flight on their flights. Um, lots of other regulations that are also built in. So what we've done is effectively taken Car Part Nine and build as much of that guidance in as is practical to the to the tool um, as possible. And this is you know this is our first application that we're launching. It's going to be available on the web. It's going to be available on mobile applications um, to really help uh, you know show off the. Um, uh, to really help allow people to access this and get, get what they need out of it. So this is probably a good point to run a video. Let me work to bring that up then for you, one second. Many hobbyists and commercial drone operators are reaching for the sky and the opportunities unlocked by remotely piloted aircraft. But in order to maintain the safety of Canada's skies, every pilot must understand and respect the rules and regulations of the airspace they would like to fly in. Those who are not clear on Canada's aviation rules and regulations run the risk of being fined or losing their equipment. NavDrone, a mobile and web application from Nav Canada, helps drone pilots and operators obtain permission quickly and legally, all while ensuring the safety of other people using the airspace. As the only app that can provide permission to drone pilots and operators to fly in Canada, NavDrone allows users to gain awareness to better understand Canada's airspace, visualize where basic and advanced drone pilots can and can't fly, create an operation, update, and manage their drone scheduled flights, and obtain automatic responses from Nav Canada when they're approved to fly. 
Additionally, NavDrone's web application provides all the mobile apps features plus more functionality and account management tools. Available for download from the Apple or Google Play stores for free or ready to use on the web at navcanada.ca slash navdrone. NavDrone is simplifying the authorization process and contributing to a safer Canadian airspace for all. Now we'll get your slides. That's great. Back, so let me yeah? jump back to the present. <laughs> That's great. Let me jump back to the presentation. Um, and there we go. Fantastic. So let me walk through some of the benefits that were called out on that video in a little, uh, you know, call, a bit, a bit more specific. So for the RPAS pilot, what does it give? Well, it's, uh, first of all, it gives you that view of airspace. Um, Jeremy also showed the drone site selection tool, and we mirrored and modeled kind of what you see in Nav Drone on that so that pilots and, um, and operators uh, weren't jarred by the experience of moving from one to the other. So you can you know, understand the airspace, understand both uh, the control zones and also kind of traffic patterns and other, other things that are occurring that uh, information for them. It then allows them to do flight planning. So either based on a radius or a path, et cetera. And if that flight plan touches controlled airspace, it gives them the ability to request authorization to access. What we built behind the system is a grid over every control zone. And that grid uh, is built up of half nautical mile um, cells. And each cell has a height threshold. So for example, if you're on the outskirts of a control zone and you want to fly at 300 feet, the, uh, on the outskirts, the height threshold is probably 400 feet. And therefore, you could get an automated approval to that request. And that automation also really helps, as you can, as you can imagine, with a significant growth in uh, this industry and the amount of requests we're getting, it gives us a safe way to automate those things. And then the things that are above the threshold, uh, they're the things that we take back uh, to our units. They do manual coordination of them uh, to consider the traffic flows, events that may be happening and make a decision on those. It also gives us more operational insight. So it allows us tactically to see um, what flights are occurring. And if we have to invoke any emergency uh, controls, to sterilize the airspace or deal with a do deal with a particular situation, we've got verified phone numbers that we can contact operators on uh, to uh, to to execute on that requirement. And also, we give through that process the operators the phone numbers for the units so they can reach back to us if they have a flyaway or other issue that they need to report immediately. So that emergency management and contact information is also uh, held within the uh, within the system. So we are live with a beta right now. It's still out there in the market. Uh, we went live in fall. Um, a number of operators, there were, there were 100 operators selected to do this. They're still using that application. Uh, it was restricted in terms of geography as well. Uh, but within the next few weeks, we're looking to, to do a more general launch to the public um, and get all of our advanced users who are requesting access to airspace into this tool as we um, will um, uh, discontinue the use of the existing uh, uh, PDF form that's generated. And then we'll do more releases of this as, as time moves forward. So we're planning another re release, for example, in the fall of this year. So what does NavDrone look like? So this is a view for a pilot or an operator. Um, and you can see there's options down the left-hand side of the screen, uh, the various things that a pilot is concerned about, his equipment, his gear, so the drones that he's have not registered. Um, if he's connected to other pilots who can use his equipment as, as the operator, he can record that in the system. And of course, the operations and flight map. And so what we're looking at here is the airspace as it appears very similar to the, the diagram that um, uh, Jeremy showed earlier. Uh, this, is, this happens to be Toronto. And you can see the red uh, here indicating that for a basic view, basic pilot, basic operations, those are places you can't fly. If you happen to have gone through that process, uh, got your advanced certificate, the airspace changes, um, and you now see the grid system. You see in control zones um, very transparently. We want to make sure people are aware of this, again, from a safety perspective. And you can plan your operations within those thresholds. Uh, but if you need to go above, you can make that, uh, make that request as well. 
So a quick view of Nav, uh, Nav Drone uh, to give you some, uh, some insights around that. Uh, there's also uh, an associated viewer. So similar to the drone site selection tool, if you don't want to register, if you're just interested in seeing how the airspace looks, maybe you're thinking about buying a drone, um, you can get on, you can have a look at basic and advanced view so you understand uh, before, you, uh, before you make that investment. Okay, last couple of areas, drone safety. Uh, awareness and education, I mentioned this at the start, really important that we will continue our work with Transport Canada and other stakeholders to make people aware of regulations, make people aware of the airspace and how to fly safely. And, and Jeremy covered some of those points um, earlier as well. Uh, we do a lot of work with airports to understand uh, and, and advance the incursion response protocols that are in place. Uh, and to support those protocols, drone detection systems are being uh, trialed at many of the airports around the country to give us electronic intelligence that we can use, uh, you know, in that uh, in that process of making sure we understand that the people entering controlled airspace uh, are supposed to be there. Lots of work to do on that, but again, lots of trials uh, that are underway right now. So a quick run through some of the drone safety uh, aspects specifically, and I'm going to wrap up just by talking a little bit about the future of uh, of our RTM and where we go from here. So this requirement to move from VLOS to BVLOS is a really important one for the industry, um, but it brings a lot of um, other considerations from a safety perspective. And so that's what Transport Canada and ourselves continue to work through as we understand that. You need BVLOS. If you want to do package delivery, for example, you need BVLOS. You can't just deliver within the, the, the sight line of sight of your drone. Uh, a lot of the emergency responses uh, that we've talked about at the start of this also require BB loss. If you're going to send um, a drone ahead of a search party, you know it's going to be out of line of sight. So there's lots of lots of considerations, lots of great use cases um, for this. We have uh, a traffic management and our past traffic management action team in place uh, in Canada. I co-chair that along with Transport Canada. That's focused on understanding. Um, all the needs of stakeholders and bringing together that picture for how this system's going to operate and how this system's going to integrate with ATM, with our traditional uh, traditional aviation partners as well. Um, it's great. We have a great bunch of stakeholders on that, and of course, COPA uh, are included uh, on that as well. One of the key items that that group works on is trials. So we've got a couple of rural-based trials that are underway right now. We'll be extending those out um, in the coming months, um, but we're taking a very stepwise approach to this. Uh, both ourselves and Transport Canada in leading this, we're making sure that we, you know, we go through each of the trials, understand the learning points, understand any risks that came out of that, and the mitigation factors that we need to put in place. Again, I go back to my opening statements on this. You know, this is all about equitable access to airspace, but doing that in a very safe way, in a very, very considered way. So that's that's the end of my uh, my prepared slides. Again, happy to answer any questions. And have and questions we have for you, Alan. So, uh, so don't worry, <laughs> there we'll keep you talking. Um, I just wanted to um, draw attention to the time. Um, we are getting close to when we had told our presenters we would be wrapping up. And if it's okay, I'll keep you here for another fifteen or so minutes, if that's all right. I can take that time from you to um, to go through some of these questions because I think they will be really valuable to to our attendees here. I'm good luck. Excellent, thank you. So, Alan, I've got a few for you first um, before we kind of open the floor up to some more general questions. Um, the biggest question that I saw popping up in the chat as you're presenting is when can we get this app? Um, and I'll add mine. I, I want to know that too. So, when when should we be able to see it in the app store for download? Yeah, so um, it, it's important for me to state this is an this is an operational system for Nav Canada, so it goes through the same rigor of, um, of safety management system and uh, quality management that we do any or, any of our other systems. We're in the last stages of that. Our intent is to get that uh, live uh, at the end of the spring. Uh, we want it in place before the summer uh, the summer activity lifts. We know it's going to continue to climb um, both seasonally and uh, and just growth of the industry. So. We want it in place before the summer. We will be releasing dates soon, just not quite there yet. So uh, we'll, we'll let you know shortly. So soon it is. We'll 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 take that. I'll allow that. Um, 
question, another question around timeline, but this is around um, approval timeline. So if I'm using the nav drone app and I um, need to get approval to fly, is that something that's happening like immediately? Does it take a certain amount of time? Is there like a lead time that's requested? Because I've, I, the record to beat is I submitted an approval once using the current form and I got um, uh, that back in seven minutes. So will the nav drone app beat? That, uh, Can that we record. beat seven minutes? That's a that's <laughs> a tough target. Um, you know, and we've had some great feedback from operators, even even though it's a, a manual process right now, um, about the the way that our units have responded and, and um, you know and serviced those. Uh, the answer though is yes. Uh, so if you are below the threshold, that response is immediate. So uh, you can. So again, it requires planning and forethought. If you can plan your missions uh, within the grid system, then you can get an immediate response. If you can't, if you're above the threshold, um, uh, you know it will take longer. It could take uh, multiple days, depending on where it is and the complexity of it. Um, the FAA, I think, uh, has, says that they they take up to 90 days to process those manual manually coordinated ones. We're not at that end of the spectrum. We are in, you know, a number of days uh, to get a response. Typically, if it's on airport operations, uh, you know, that could actually affect what we're doing. That will be a more in-depth conversation. Clearly, um, but we'd expect the majority of them to be within, you know, three, four, five days uh, if they require additional coordination. Okay, that sounds great. And is there any functionality within the app um, for additional Nav Canada resources? I'm thinking like contact information for ATC, if that's something that's, you know, in an emergency that would be requested, the kinds of things that um, there aren't any real RPAS specific resources for that exist right now. And we're having to coach people to, like, this is how to reference the CFS, this is how to get that information out of here. Is there anything like that that's being included? Yeah, so first of all, we've, we're, cr we're creating a new website to go with this. We've got new videos and things to help people use the application. So that just for this, there are additional resources. Um, certainly, when you get um, a permission request approval, part of the information you'll get is the direct phone numbers for the units should something occur um, so that you can reach directly. And so if you have that flyaway or other situation, you can reach directly to the unit. So that is provided as standard uh, with a, with an approval as well. Okay, fantastic. And with that approval, I know for some manufacturers to operate the RPAS within certain areas they have their own restrictions like dji for example has some no fly zones will there be any documentation or kind of that's provided so that you can get those approvals in those locked areas from the manufacturer so the, the so what we provide is permission to access controlled airspace um operators can use that and can you know send that to dji we don't formally interact interact with the DJI process. Um, it is, um, you know, that's something that DJI brings in. It's 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 great because it provides an extra level of protection for, uh, for airports, um, but it doesn't follow our regulations and it doesn't particularly follow the design of, of, air, of airspace and how we restrict. So um, it, it's not that it's a bad thing, but we have no way of formally interacting, but certainly operators and pilots can take a permission uh, request information that they get approval and they can use that as part of that um, geofencing unlock process. Okay, okay, fantastic. Um, is there any value in the app for non RPAS pilots um, in terms of understanding where drones are operating or that kind of thing? I think so, uh, you know, and I'd, I'd like to see people kind of re rely on this. It's like I say, it's gonna be a, you know, a mobile app um, as well as uh, a web-based app. I'd love to see this some something that people, whenever they're about to fly, you know, when they're doing the the site surveys and something, they they go in and they use this. Um, it's certainly to just to double check the airspace. It provides a, an easier to digest way of looking at no times that may be relevant uh, and different things that that affect people. So even in Class G, yes, I think there's benefits to them in terms of recording their flights and things, um, um, and and even with the micro drone you know, allows you to understand because there are restrictions, as Jeremy pointed to, there are some specific restrictions. So you can't, for example, fly in restricted airspace. You couldn't take your micro drone and fly over Parliament Hill. Now, we, we don't have a micro drone view. They've just built one into the DSST. We'll be building that in later in the year 
um, uh, to give that uh, to give that view specifically. Um, but it is it is all it, it, it is all important information. So yeah, I really do think there's a benefit for people using it generally. Fantastic. So then you could be a micro drone pilot and say, like, heads up, I'm going to be flying at this location, um, you know, Scarborough Bluffs or something. And that way you can identify if there's other drone pilots in the same area. Um, exactly. And I guess even too, if you're you're maybe a float plane pilot and you're planning on, you know, a low level flight over the Fraser River or something, you'd be able to take a look at the app and see if there's planned drone flights along that road as well. So if you are a drone pilot and you register a flight, it will tell you if there are other overlapping operations within that area. It's not specifically meant for other pilots at this point, but that's that's an interesting point. I'll take that away. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. I'll leave that one with you. Um, so I've seen, and I'll start bringing um, the rest of the panelists in on this as well. I've seen, um, you had mentioned as well, the drone site selection tool um, and it having the micro drone layer. That's something that the NAV drone app's looking to have later in the year. Um, when do you see those two tools like overlapping? How do they work? What value do they each provide? Yeah, and I'll, I'll uh, throw this over to Jeremy as well. My, my view is, again, we've tried to make it seamless so that people could operate between the two right now. So as people are used to looking at DSST, they see a similar view. Um, you know, we'd, we'd love for this to become the, the tool of, you know, the, the, uh, the view that people go to because it's got the extra functionality uh, in as well. But uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you want to uh, mention that uh, the DSST tool as well. Yeah, so you know, obviously we're proud of what NRC has done, but it's gotten to the point where we can support the rollout of the Nav Drone app, and that's really our intent. And so I would see the transitioning happening as long as soon as we can uh, do it without any loss of situa situational awareness. Um, and the ongoing tool will be the Nav Drone app, and we look forward to its rollout. Fantastic. Yeah, I can see there. You know, there's kind of the pre-planning, kind of testing the water, see what things look like in the site selection tool, and then operationally, the nav drone app's gonna start um, taking over some of those functions. That's great. Um, early on, there was a comment um, about, just regarding the anxiety as a traditional pilot, uh, especially as we see the growth um, grows we do. I was um, on that um, Canadac, um, first meeting that Christine mentioned earlier, and um, it was mentioned that there's now more registered remotely piloted aircraft than there are registered traditional aircraft in Canada, um, which I thought was a, an interesting point to bring out. And um, so for those pilots that are out there, they see the risk, you know, I'm in the aircraft, this is, this is a greater risk for me to be flying. How do you address those concerns? Maybe I'll start with, with Alan and then we can roll to TC after Jeremy after that. Yeah, and and it is very much a the, the VLOS regulations are very clear on this. Um, and you know we continue to um, support and put other risk mitigation factors in place as we move forward. But fundamentally our past pilots have to um, keep visual line of sight and they have to stay away from all other forms of aviation. And so they're the primary mi risk mitigation element within this, um, you know, and we see that we, we see that being effective in terms of the sort of the segregation we have of airspace um, today. Um, as we as we look to, to move forward into BB loss, we, we find other ways to mitigate some of those risks, including things like considerations for detect and avoid and, and other ways of um, replacing that see and be seen um, uh, aspect of things. But for VLOS, it really does rest with the drone pilots to ensure that they're managing safely and staying out of the way of uh, traditional aviation. Jeremy, I don't know if you want to add to that. Sure. Um, I'll start with the biggest risks. So something flying that's big. So that'll be under an SFOC right now. It's greater than 25 kilograms. And the SFOC process borrows heavily on the other parts of the cars within, so part four, five, seven, um, like we, the the restrictions are, um, each one of those situations is looked at very specifically. They're gonna be in specific areas. And for instance, with our BB loss trials ongoing right now, um, it's assumed that the traditional aviation aircraft will have no knowledge of and is not talking to 
the people that are operating the drone. It's it's up to the drone to get out of out of the way. So let's bring that back down below 25 kilograms. So I don't see much of a risk above 25 kilograms right now. It's very conservative. It's in very conservative areas, uh, in in very selective ways. So below 25 kilograms, if you look at um, the micro drone air, the micro drone layer. So the research to date has just, has shown that those 249 grams and below the risk um, across the board is quite quite low. So we're really talking about uh, 250 grams to 200 to 25 kilograms. And I'll try to make this quick. Um, exactly as Alan said, it's on the pilot. They have to be able to see it at all times, um, and uh, and they have to keep it below 400 feet. Um, if they don't, it is very easy to submit a, a drone reporting um, incident form, a drone incident report form, which will put that to the appropriate agencies right away. Um, although it does need to have the right the amount of information, like who was flying it, which can be difficult, I can understand. Um, it is people based at the moment, so that's why it's up to the drone and it's quite drone pilot. It is very clear, although the, the traditional pilot, of course, will do whatever is required. Um, but technology is coming and we're looking forward to that because the technological options are once they are in place, we'll be able to move um, into an integration function rather than a segregation function. And right now we're trying to keep the two away from each other. So the, the design, the basis is keep them away from each other and then um, no more integration until we have the level of safety required to assure uh, the appropriate amount of detect and avoid. I'm kind of rambling there. I hope I'm getting to the point. If I'm not, please feel free to come back at me. No, I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It's essentially, it's on the drone pilot for now. Um, we're gonna work on keeping everything separate, keep a little bit of a buffer in terms of altitude. Um, and then, uh, and then until we can ensure safety using technology or new systems, then we'll then we'll keep them separate until we can work those things in to address the integration of airspace. And a big part of it is education, which is also, as, as Alan mentioned, his role, our role, we're getting out there, we're having drone seminar days, drone talks. Um, we, we have no drone zones. Um, so we do need the education to go both ways, um, both to let pilots know that in that low level environment, if you thought that flying around at 300 feet was a great idea before, um, we could have a chat, but um, it's probably you might want to be more aware, especially in areas where you'd expect that uh, people would be flying their drones. So education, I think, is a big portion of this. And I think that that's where COPA will play a big part as well, is in is in educating uh, on both sides, the you know, both the, the pilot, uh, piloted aircraft operator and the remotely piloted aircraft operator. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, the education is kind of doubly because you know, learning what you can do as well. I think coming from a traditional background, you may be under the impression that there are more restrictions on what you're allowed to do to do than than what Transport Canada's put in place. Um, so having that education allows you to to use your drone to your fullest extent as well. So it's also an, an something that's enabling, not just um, you know detracting and, and kind of making you aware so you can't argue ignorance anymore or something like that, which isn't valid anyway. Um, I'd like to end on a slightly different note. So um, let's go around and maybe we'll start with you, Christine. What are you most excited for about the future of aviation in Canada? Um, I think for me, it's, it's you know, it, I, I find in the last 10 years, the world of, it, of aviation has changed exponentially. Uh, I mean, exponentially. Uh, you know, when I stopped flying commercially uh, a little over, I guess it was about 16 years ago, I was still using a map. GPS was literally just coming out. Um, you know, I flew across the Atlantic with with a map. I, I didn't have a GPS. You know, I was flying airway to airway. Uh, so in 15 years, there's been so much change. And I see that happening in the next 10 years. And I see that happening not just on the, uh, on the, uh, you know, piloted aircraft side, but I see that happening on the remotely piloted aircraft side. And I'm really excited to be part of that change that's happening. Um, I, I think that for a lot of people, uh, you know, fear comes out of not knowing. 
and uh, by by informing ourselves and by providing that information to all of our pilots, whether it's traditional uh, aviation or remotely piloted uh, aircraft aviation, uh, I think arming them with the knowledge that they that they they need to have continually, and and me having that knowledge myself because this is a whole new world for all of us. Um, that's what has me very very excited. I'm so happy, and I'm I'm so proud to be able to 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 introduce this new program, to be able to share this knowledge, to take some of that fear away. Um, you know, it change is going to happen. Um, you know, whether we like it or not, change is going to happen. And it might as well happen uh, with us being part of that change so that we can uh, remove some of that fear for, uh, for our members. I think that's wonderfully said. Yeah, I uh, echo that wholeheartedly. And Jeremy, for you, what are, what are you most excited for? Um, I think I'm most excited for the, so I'll, I'll keep the, the theme going with change. Um, I love, I'm sorry. I love what Four Flight can do for me. I love what my EFBs can do. I love the fact that uh, due to um, uh, experimental aircraft, I've got a, a couple G5s and a, and a spec, like if you know what, so new aircraft avionics are getting a little bit cheaper, although they're still quite expensive. New things are, the, the what only huge autopilots can do now, very small autopilots can do but I see drones dragging us into the future even faster. So within TC, something like the drone management portal, um, not all aspects can be um, uh, brought in from other, but certainly it's nice to be able to pay right away, get your certificate right away, get your results right away. Um, and I see that as I'm trying to finish up the rest of uh, some of my TC exams. Um, so bringing us into the future, the new level of innovation that will get us there and then accessibility. I'm excited about the fact that my son is so excited about this because, you know, he gets to be anything in life as long as he's a pilot, right? No, I can't say that. But <laughs> if this is a good step, right, I can say, no, this is just like when you're flying your drone and you're doing this thing, then it's all related. So um, I do hope that it'll make more make it more accessible. Um, I want people, more people thinking about it and me, people getting excited about it because, you know, how long has it been since people thought that getting on a plane was routine? And they have for so long, and now they're thinking about it in new ways and uh, just reinvigorating the space. So I'm I'm excited. I'm happy to be part of it. Excellent, thank you. Um, and Alan, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. Where where do you think things are going? That's that's most exciting for you in your role. Oh, where to start? I mean, I've spent my career helping digitize you know and bring technology to bear that improves people's lives improves organizations and, and helps economy and and all of those things are true and i i have to confess to, you know i love to hear the stories particularly about the first responders and the work they do and the difference that that makes and and you know while that while you see that in the immediacy of that impact in those situations just the potential of this industry integrating with traditional aviation um, has such potential for, for, for all of Canada industry and for us to do things differently. And Jeremy pointed earlier to the fact that, you know, Canada's got ahead uh, in some of these things that other countries are, are kind of still catching up to. And I think we've got a great opportunity here to the, from the work that Transport Canada's already done and continues to do, forums like the Canada that Christine's, uh, Christine's on as well, um, you know, the way we can bring stakeholders together, the way we can work with it with NAV Canada. I think bringing all that together, we've got a great opportunity to progress this and progress in a really safe way, but really then bring the benefits that, that, that comes with that uh, at all levels. So, yeah, I'm excited about it. <laughs> I'm not going to try and end on a, on a better note than that. I think you summed it up really nicely for me. Um, I really want to thank you all for your time and your extra time this morning. We're a few minutes over time, but it's uh, I think it was all really valuable. Um, and thank you to our attendees as well. Um, the questions were, I think, really key in extending this beyond what we had in the planned in the presentations. Um, if there are other comments or questions that you have, I encourage you to reach out to COPA. Um, we'll do our best to point you to the right resources that are out there and continue with that mission of educating on both sides to, um, to make sure that we're all moving forward in this in this positive direction as as the side of the industry continues to grow. So thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Christine. And thank you to all the attendees. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you all at the uh, virtual fly-in in June.
Thanks so much, Thanks, Kate. Everybody. Thanks, Kate. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you.